conference, and I'm very pleased to be a part of it. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, employment-oriented social protection, um, and in particular, the National Employment Guarantee Scheme in India, and the targeting the ultra-poor program in Pakistan. Now, there's a, a very sound rationale for focusing on employment orientation uh, because of um, the fact that we're in a part of the world which has had quite strong rates of growth, but has been, it has been described as jobless growth. It simply has not generated the level of decent jobs that would help to pull large sections of the poor out of poverty. But it isn't just the deficit in jobs that is a problem in South Asia. It is also the problem of intersecting inequalities of, space, of location, caste, gender, ethnicity, and so on, and the ways in which these trap people in chronic poverty over generations. And because of the scale of the problem, we have to remember that only about a maximum of 10% of people are in formal employment in South Asia. The scale of the problem means that we cannot talk uh, only in terms of social assistance. So it, the language of protection and promotion is one that has originated from uh, work in South Asia. And it refers to finding forms of protection that contain the potential for helping people to climb out of poverty, what I've called opportunity ladders. Um, now, these, both these programs are relatively new, as part of the emerging. But interestingly, both of them have their roots in other programs that go back many years. And so one of the first points I think I'd like to make is that policy continuity is really quite important in the field of social protection. Let me not toss that over. Uh, partly because you need to institutionalize social protection uh, and introduce a bit of predictability in the lives of people who are people who are living very insecure lives, but also policy commitment allows for learning from experience. And both the programs I'm talking about are the products of quite a lot of experience. So the NREGS has its origins in the Maharashtra Employment Guarantee Scheme that was put in place in the state of Maharashtra in 1978 after some major droughts. And that introduced the idea that the government had a legal obligation to provide employment on demand if a minimum of 15 people within a locale demanded it. The employment had to be provided within eight kilometers of that locality and within 15 days, or uh, the government could be taken to court and an unemployment benefit could be paid. It required equal wages for men and women, on-site drinking water, childcare, and first aid. India has had many other employment uh, public works programs, but it was not until 2005 when the United Progressive Platform came in uh, that the um, idea of employment guarantee was revived, this time at a national level. So the National Employment Guarantee Act, built on the Maharashtra scheme, uh, but added a few features which were lessons learned, one is that it limited the guarantee of employment to just 100 days rather than indefinite. Uh, it required state minimum wages to be paid. It banned private contractors in implementation and put the locally elected officials in charge. And it had, because of the process deficits that have been documented, it had a number of accountability provisions, such as the right to information about documents, the public payment of wages, and social audits. Later provision was made for wages to be paid into a bank account. And according to the, um, the website, wage employment in 2013-14 was for over 73 lakhs, that's a, a lakh is 100,000, uh, individuals of whom 48% were women, so much higher than the quota. Bangladesh has also had uh, uh, public employment programs. And in fact, in the, the food crisis of 2008, the government hurriedly introduced something called the 100 days employment. But it was very hurriedly implemented, and it is to another program, the rural maintenance program, that we might look to see how lessons are learned over time. The rural employment program was the product of a pilot in 1983. Bangladesh is a country where women are not supposed to work in the public domain, and the existing food for work program, many women were turned away because officials didn't approve of them, 
Others didn't even come forward. So they experimented and then built a rural maintenance program which was meant only for what we call destitute women. Either women without husbands or ailing husbands, who are women who are primary breadwinners. And these uh, are, are about maintaining rural urban works all year round. And they provide uh, work to 10 destitute women per, per union. And because demand outstrips supply, uh, the women are chosen by lottery. Uh, there's a mandatory savings provision. About a fifth of their wages is put into a bank account, which they can't touch for the four years that they are on that program. And regular training was added over time. First, of course, in road maintenance, then in health, social awareness, and then in business and financial skills. So around 42,000 women were provided with employment each year. And in 2006, the government took it over. It was managed by Care International till then. Targeting the ultra-poor also has its origins. This time in a, a vulnerable group, group feeding program that was put in place in 1975 after a major famine, which evolved into group, vulnerable group development. BRAC and World Food Program got together to uh, add an income generating component to the vulnerable group development program, which had um, provision for giving women access to loans, microfinance training, and so on. But it was found by the end of the 1990s that the extreme poor amongst these groups were simply not benefiting. They were dropping out, they were not taking advantage of loans, and so on. And so in 2002, we got the Targeting the Ultra Poor program, which I think is um, a very good example, of a paradigmatic example, of a program designed to overcome the multiple and overlapping constraints that make up the gendered nature of extreme poverty in Bangladesh. So it has a mixed methodology to identify people. It has a transfer of productive assets plus a uh, cash stipend so that women can focus on their, on their enterprises rather than having to do wage work, health support, mandatory savings, training and mentoring, intensive mentoring. Uh, I persuaded the BRAC officials not to call it hand-holding because that sounds a little patronizing. So we call it intensive mentoring and uh, elite support. And by 2011, it had reached 400,000 women. Now, um, when we talk about sustainability, okay. All right. when we talk about sustainability, obviously the financial aspect is very important. But I think this new generation of evaluations, which point to the wider impacts of social protection, are very important in justifying these programs. And what we find with the NREGS is that because it's been scaled up to the national level, very mixed outcomes. However, while we see evidence that there is some rationing of jobs because demand outstrips supply, it is reaching the poorest groups and it is very effective in reaching the, so, the tribal and Dalit, the, 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 the lowest caste groups. And as we saw, women make up far more of the, of the 30%. It has had significant poverty reducing effects, particularly for the poorest, changes in people's lives and sending children to school and so on. However, one of the more negative, or depending on which side of the uh, debate you are, aspects of it is that it seems to be driving up agricultural wages, particularly female wages, uh, which is not so good for farmers, small farmers, but it's very good for agricultural workers who are amongst the poorest paid in the Indian economy. But it's not clear if the wages are being driven up by market forces, as someone has suggested, or by actual active bargaining. Certainly, the Maharashtra Employment Guarantee Scheme documents many examples of workers being empowered by the scheme to bargain for higher wages. There has been a de decline in distress migration in West Bengal, and uh, these are the state-level findings. And also, interestingly, given what we've been hearing from the others, uh, participation in the NREGS results in better educational outcomes for children, particularly girls, over and above the income effect, and it seems to be related to the increase in bargaining power, decision-making power within the household, while father's participation is associated with negative educational outcomes, particularly in poorer households. Of course, the process deficits continue. We have faulty muster rolls, long delay in payments, corruption and leakages, and so on. But as one of the less positive evaluations concluded, Despite this, what we need is an overhaul of the governance of the program, but that sense of entitlement that it has instilled in very poor workers is one that needs to be valued and built. 
Um, development potential of public works. There was a very interesting study a long time ago about the local economy effects of the Food for Work program. Wage employment increasing, self-employment declining, um, agricultural production increasing, and so on. Nothing of this scale has been done more recently, but the care evaluations of the road building projects show overall increases in commercial freight and passenger volumes, and that while men continue to make more use of the roads that are built, the rate of increase is much higher for women. And in particular, women's access and children's access to school, health clinics, and NGOs have been improved by uh, the building of infrastructure. The other uh, uh, evaluations of the rural maintenance program show what it does for individual women, that many of them continue to earn what they were earning on the program after they've left, and are, re and are able to provide meals for their families. And a recent study by IFPRI uh, says that both the IGVGD, BRAX, and the RMP resulted in longer-term improvement in the income of participants, which lasted 18 months for the IGVGD and 25 months for RMP. They also found, and this is interesting, that the two public works programs they evaluated, road maintenance and food for assets, led to far more positive outcomes in terms of women's empowerment, and that we're talking about decision-making, mobility, and so on, than the IGVGD, which was promoting enterprise and self-employment. Looking at the development potential of TUP, uh, it has also benefited from randomized control trials built into the program from the outset. So all, anybody who's anybody, I think, in the RCT field have come in to evaluate the TUP. So we've got people and the pilots. So we're finding very positive outcomes. The first round of studies, uh, three or four years after the program was put in place. And the program is supposed to graduate women out of poverty in, in two years through this combination of, uh, of um, uh, supports. Found higher incomes that, and greater livelihood uh, asset li uh, ownership. The second round found that, um, which was actually car carried out by the IGC at LSE, found that women were moving out of poorly paid wage employment into more regular forms of self-employment, and that total earnings, earned by, earnings rose by 38% two years after they had graduated out of the program, and savings were also increasing. There was some evidence of a rise in wages for unskilled wage labor, female wage labor. However, a much more recent study finds that the impact of women's ownership and role in decision making does not extend beyond the assets transferred by the program. All other assets and all other forms of decision making are under male control. And it appears in fact to have had a negative impact on women's control over income savings and expenditure decisions Although the qualitative data on TUP shows something more positive, and that is women appreciate having work within the home because of the hostility of the external environment uh, to women. In terms of the questions that we were asked, I think the fact that we have public works programs across the world, more or less successful, suggests that they are scalable and transferable, uh, provided, of course, the administrative and logistical requirements are met. But the issue is how transferable and scalable is the employment guarantee? And that really is a very different kettle of fish. The move from the Maharashtra scheme to the national scheme is an example of both transferring to other states in India and scaling up. But it has met, as we know, with problems and very uneven performance across the states. An employment guarantee needs a responsive state and active citizens. And these do not always exist. But I think the question we might ask is, could it act as a catalyst to building more responsive bureaucrats and active citizens? And I say this because the Maharashtra Employment Guarantee Scheme has many examples of wage workers becoming more active, of uh, civil society organizing uh, poor people to demand wages, of putting pressure on local officials, and so on. So going back to Koshik's talk yesterday about uh, the focal point, which I don't like that word very much. It means something else to me. But anyway, this, this business of creating a legal uh, obligation, can it generate the kind of um, impacts or the kind of outcomes that we want to see in terms of states and, uh, and civil, civil society? I think there is a very interesting uh, comparison that Mick Moore makes between the Maharashtra Employment Guarantee Scheme and the Employment Assurance Scheme in India which is just like the Maharashtra one, but without the guarantee. 
and you find no evidence of mobilization around the employment assurance scheme, but you do find, you did find a great deal of mobilization around the Maharashtra Fund, and you do find it around the NRAGS. Transformative scalability, we're looking into TUP. Is it, there are pilots being carried out, 10 pilots in eight countries across the world. And I said, as I said, you know, there's uh, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, uh, Dean Carlin, uh, all the people who've been, you know, leading on the RCT field are involved in these pilots, in evaluating these pilots. And the results are coming in. They can help us a little bit with the transferability question, not scalability, because these pilots are very small. But as a, a recent conference in Paris uh, reported on the BRAC website, four out of the five RCTs showed increased food security, increased as well as more diverse incomes, increased assets, all in all. We are setting the stage for further explorations of scalability. However, some caution is needed. Our, the four out of five were positive. The one that wasn't was in Andhra. And it found that the income that women made through being involved in the TU pre program was offset by the income they lost through withdrawing from wage employment. And this, of course, is at a time when wages for agricultural laborers were rising, partly because of the NREGS, and women's wages were rising. So, um, as Modoc says, you know, you really do have to look at the, or, or the larger opportunity structure in order to decide whether providing women with these opportunities is the most uh, feasible way of, of helping them. And certainly in Sindh, where we did an evaluation of TUP, we found that there was no labor, there was no wage labor for women, but also that women's earning capacity and mobility capacity was so restricted that all they did was basket weaving and embroidery. In that context, it was women who had husbands who could make use of TUP support that were, that were able to uh, benefit from the program. And then a very recent uh, study of the Bangladesh TUP finds that six years, so the Bandiera, the LSE studies were four years after, this is six years, that 54% of TUP households had exp uh, experienced a decline in asset stock and income. And of course, the Sindh and other studies from, I think, uh, Haiti tell us that those who have some kind of initial advantage are much more likely to benefit. So there is uneven impact even within, across countries and amongst participants. And then my final point, I think, would be that some aspects of TUP are easier to transfer than others. The intensive mentoring, how easy is that to transfer? The fact that the West Bengal study that we did had, was carried out by an organization that was very responsive to the needs of the poor, had worked with extremely poor women and self-help groups for a long time, made them manage and negotiate the TUP program much better than the SIND one, where it was being managed by a microfinance program whose only experience was with male entrepreneurs. So to that extent, I think that the skills and the human element of the program must be thought through before you think of transferring. So my conclusion then would be, it, my reading of this literature echoes a debate that took place in the Indian literature around the time of the Integrated Rural Development Project, etc. And that is to say, at that time, credit intervention seemed to work best for those who had the complementary resources you need to make use of credit. Those who were assetless were most likely to benefit from wage employment. Today, we're looking at uh, self-employment, enterprise development for extremely poor women. And the literature on enterprise is always looking for the entrepreneurial personality, you know, the person who has the traits to be an entrepreneur. And the key trait is the ability to take risks. And I don't see how you can expect extremely poor women to take the kind of risks that are necessary to make success of their enterprises without the kind of support that, say, a self-help group could do. So the other thing, of course, that troubles me is the empowerment studies. And this is very much in line with the study that we've done at, uh, at IDS, which found that in Ghana, Bangladesh, Egypt, where the three countries we did a survey, that regular wage employment and employment outside the house had far stronger association with empowerment indicators than work within the home, particularly unpaid work with the home. That's not you know, uh, dramatically uh, surprising, but it seems to be mirrored now 
in the empowerment evaluations of wage employment in, in Andhra Pradesh and in Bangladesh and self-employment for very poor women. Thank you. Thank you.